Um, I just want to say thanks for coming and welcome here this morning. It's a beautiful day. It'd be a great day to stay home and rake your yard. Instead, it's a better day to come. Yeah, see, everybody's like, I don't, I don't want to do that. No, no. You're here. That's good. That's great. I was uh, just, you may have saw me just run out of church there. It's uh, the... the uh, the thought of a soldier going to battle without his sword is kind of a bad thing, so I had to go and get my sword. I was sitting here and I'm thinking, Lord, what do you, what do you want for me to share this morning? And I've shared this before. We, we enter into worship a number of times, but I just want to read to you one more time Psalms 150 before we, before we worship this morning. Psalms 150 says, this, this is the psalmist, and think about this is the last psalm that we have recorded. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Have you ever experienced one of God's mighty acts of power? Who's experienced one of God's mighty acts of power? That's it? Yeah, I think we need to praise God for his mighty acts of, of power. Um, praise him for his surpassing greatness praise him with sounding trumpets we don't have trumpets so we can fill in the drum praise him with a harp and with a lyre we don't have a harp and a lyre we'll use a keyboard praise him with a tambourine I've seen that praise him with dancing okay all right well I'm just giving you the option here praise him with strings and with flute because it's scriptural we could do that I mean we're, we might be Norwegian and maybe this is it you know but we can do that that's okay some cultures would consider that dancing um, praise him with tambourine with dancing praise him with strings and with flute praise him with the clash of cymbals <laughs> resounding cymbals let everything that has breath who qualifies again you know Norwegian we sit out there sometimes no 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 if you can do that, anybody, one cleansing breath. Everybody with me. In deep. Come on, four of you did not do it. I saw you. I'm still questioning. Deep breath. Ready? You know, sometimes we just need to take in God that way. Sometimes we just need to take in God that way. Take in his peace. Take in his joy. Take in who he is. Our world, we reflect. There are times, folks, when we reflect our emotion. We f- reflect our circumstances on who God is. And the truth of the matter is, my day has nothing to do with who God is. Who God is should have everything to do with my day. He cares about every aspect of it. Every aspect of it. But just because I'm sad doesn't mean he's sad. Just because I'm feeling a little disconnected doesn't mean he wants to be disconnected. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's open with a word of prayer and let's stand this morning. I want to encourage you this morning to praise the Lord. If he's revealed himself as great to you, if he's revealed himself to you in any way, I want you to praise the Lord this morning. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your life. We thank you for the breath that you have given us, God. We thank you that this morning we have breath because of who you are. You breathe. Your word declares that you breathe the breath of life into man. Well, we're man, and that means you have breathed the breath of life into us, oh God. Lord, I pray that you would help us to reflect that breath, to respond to that breath that you've given us. God, it's, it's our heart's desire this morning to just to come before you and to worship you creator of heaven and earth creator of all that there is thank you for your goodness towards us father we praise you this morning just say it with me father we praise you this morning we praise you this morning we praise you this morning if your heart's not in that place get it there Get it there. You can just you can speak that into existence. David said, rise up, my soul. He spoke to himself. He's like, everybody around me is not speaking. To I'm going to speak to myself. Rise up, rise up, rise up. He told himself, rise up and worship the Lord. We can do that. We have the ability to do that. People might look at you and think you're nuts because you're talking to yourself. But the reality is David did it. It's good for us. We can do it. When you're fa- faced with the struggles and the difficulties, tell your soul to rise up and to worship the Lord. That's a choice that we make. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to start with the rise. Take your place, God. One thing.
you are. Yes, Lord. Awesome is your name. Great are you, Lord, and mighty in strength.
Blessed be. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name.
your glorious name. Your name is glorious, God.
because you were forsaken, I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again.
desire, God, is to honor you. Father, that you would be lifted up and glorified, that your name would be blessed. And we just thank you today for arising in our hearts. We thank you for divine appointments because we know, God, that you have plans that we do not know and do not see. And Father, that we would be willing to say, here we are, here we are, use us. God, use us to spread your word, the truth of who you are, this morning and have a seat. Good morning. If we could have our ushers bring our uh, ushers come forward, we will take our morning offering. <clears throat> Again, we just want to thank you so much for your giving, giving into God's kingdom. It's how his kingdom is advanced by us, first of all, giving back a portion of what he's given to us. I mean, how many of you know that that's our source? Christ is our source. God is the one, according to scripture, it says he's the one who gives us the ability to gain wealth. And so by us giving back, it's simply an extension of our worship to God. So let's, uh, let's pray over this offering this morning. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you, God, that you have blessed us. You've poured so richly into our lives. God, it is our desire simply to put back a portion of what you've given us. And God, I pray that as we continue to give and you continue to pour into our life, it's a cycle that just doesn't stop. God, as that takes place, that we would continue to give more. Lord, I'd like to see individuals rise up and try to outgive you. That would be kind of fun to watch. Lord, I thank you for your goodness towards us, and I ask you to just bless this offering. Give us wisdom, Father, as we, as we use this to further your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 A few announcements. I uh, want us to take a look at the announcements that we have this week. Um, you should have got a bulletin when you came in. Um, Monday night is prayer, dynamic prayer. I want to encourage you to come and be a part. I've had the opportunity uh, last week to come and pray. A couple weeks ago I came and, and I just want to encourage you to come and be a part of that prayer time. If there's going to be any life breathed into our congregation, any life that comes out of this congregation and into the community, it's going to be because we fueled the fires of prayer. That's the reality. That's the reality. We can do and you might say, well, you know what, I'm not that stand-up front guy, kind of guy that's going to get up and pray. That's fine. Then kneel down by an altar someplace or by a pew and just come and pray. It really is going to be about how much we give in those areas. So I want to encourage you to come and be a part of that. Also, um, from 6.30 to 8.30 on Monday night, Barry is going through the book of Acts. And I want to encourage you to come and be a part of that. Um, we're going to have a number of things coming up in the very near future that we're going to be involved in. There's going to be some more night classes going on. There's going to be some more things. So I want to encourage you to kind of get your head ready to start thinking about us doing more events, more things going on here at the church. So also Tuesday night is the bondage breaker that Cindy Lou is doing. Um, I just, again, if you know somebody who's dealing with 
with uh, struggles in their life, maybe unforgiveness, hurts, things that have taken place, I want you to encourage them to come and be a part of that. Wednesday night, March 18th, is our DL Middle School uh, night from 6.30 to 8.30. It's free volleyball, basketball, dodgeball, uh, all kinds of stuff going on. I want to encourage you. This is probably going to be our last uh, night for the year, so come and be a part of that. Um, also, the Wednesday or the Friday Bible study. I want you to take a look um, we are going to do a fundraiser for Andy and Katie Erb. Andy had a brain aneurysm or a brain bleed, and, and uh, during that time, Katie was running back and forth to Fargo quite a bit, and they incurred quite a few expenses. On the back table, you will see out in the foyer, there are bulletins that we can hand out. If you have a place at work that will let you put these up, I want to encourage you to do that. If you have friends, I, w- I just want to encourage you. We need to get the word out. That's this coming Saturday night. And um, it's Saturday, March 21st from 4 to 7. Here's the deal. We have partnered up with uh, Frazee, Harvest, Harvest Fellowship Church in Frazee, because Andy and Katie have gone there a little bit since they moved down there, and they've come here somewhat. And, and the folks from, from Harvest Fellowship in Frazee are going to come up and help us serve. This is a great opportunity for us as churches to work together. How many of you know we're all on the same side, Right. We're not in competition with each other, folks. We, we compete with, with fishing and golf courses. That's who we compete with on Sunday mornings. We don't compete with other churches. So they're going to send up a half a dozen people. I really need six people to volunteer to be here Saturday starting at about 3 o'clock to get supper ready to go. I, I, have, I have a good friend by the name of Alan Schoenberger who shoots big. He shoots high all the time. You know what? I'm believing that we're going to have 500 people that come through the doors. As a matter of fact, we're believing so much that we're going to have 500 people that we bought spaghetti and sauce for 500 people. All right? You know how that's going to happen? It's going to happen by you helping us get the word out, take a couple of these flyers, tell people, trust me, there are a lot of herbs around. And a lot of people know the herbs. And if they just know that there is an event for Andy, we'll have people here. So I'm going to need six people. Where's Vonnie? Vonnie? Right there. No, no, higher, higher. Vonnie and, and Jane. Jane, raise your hand. Ra- yeah, don't, don't go to Jane, okay? But I want to tell you, Jane has been working this past week to try and get some stuff lined up. She's been working with a gal from Harvest. They just did a big fundraiser down there. By the way, it doesn't say it on here because they've had a little idea of doing a bake sale with it, and then we decided not to, and then we decided we should, and then we decided we shouldn't, and this morning, we're going to. How's that? Woohoo! Oh, come on. How is that? Woohoo! So make a pan of bars. Get them here this, this, well, later on in the week. Don't make them on Monday. They'll be a little stale by Saturday. But I want to tell you, I need two crews of people. I need six people to help volunteer make spaghetti. Men, I know that you're able to make spaghetti and mix it up and get it in pots and help serve. Guys, you can help do this. And then I want four people to help clean up afterwards. I don't want our spaghetti crew, the people who are there early to get things ready and to get things prepared. I don't want them to have to stay afterwards. So if you are willing to be one of those two crews, I need to know today. When do I need to know? Today. Because today, today, we're going to, we're making, we're nailing this thing. And if I don't know by today, then starting tomorrow, people getting phone calls. Look at that. They cut my microphone off just as I was going for the punchline. Tomorrow, we're going to start making phone calls. I, folks, we, we really need help for this. I need your help. So please, I'm going to encourage you. Jane. Okay. I knew that, actually. I was thinking at 2 was what I was thinking. 2 o'clock, you need to be here, right? 12? Wow, I need somebody else to help me plan this. See, I need help. I need help. Uh, a couple of people are going to have to be here at 12 o'clock for sure, but probably not everybody. More the better. Okay, there you go. I know nothing. I need helpers. We need volunteers. We need folks. So it is going to be a long day for those folks who are helping. Um, so please get in touch with me. Also, you see in the notes that we've got, we need uh, volunteers for the ushers. We need uh, some construction work going on up at Strawberry Lake. Jim Hokinson, raise your hand in the back. 
Jim is going to begin construction, uh, tearing apart a couple of rooms for him up at Strawberry Lake. We need some volunteers. You look in the back at our sound booth. Look in the back at our sound booth. Those three guys, oh, four, those three, four people, they, they're there every Sunday, in and out, faithfully. Our worship team is up here, in and out, every week, faithfully. How about we give them a hand? And now what I need you to understand is people who are in those positions week in and week out, week in and week out, week in and week out, burn out. They burn out. They can only do that so long. And so I'm going to encourage you. Ushers, it's the same way. We have the same few ushers. Folks, we need to get plugged in. You need, I'm just going to say it, we, we need to get here where we can plug in an extra hour early and be part of a tech team or be part of an usher team. You're the body. You're the ones who make this work. You're the ones who make this function. So I want to encourage you to please ask the Lord. And if God says, no, I don't want you to do that, I'm going to ask, ask you to ask him again and just make sure you're hearing, okay? Just make sure that you're hearing. Uh, Mallory Huddleston uh, is going to come up in just a few seconds because Miss um, Seberg is going to go downstairs or Miss Fagley is going to go downstairs and get Mallory Huddleston up here. That's going to happen. Mallory did not have the opportunity to share um, in her experience going to Haiti because she was in the hospital that day. And so God has touched her, healed her. They figured out what was going on there. And I've asked Mallory to come and share five minutes her experience from Haiti. I want to tell you as a, as a pastor, um, just as a person going on this missions trip, it's hard for me to get my brain back to what's going on here in Minnesota. Um, it's hard for me to focus on some of the things, even like the fundraiser. God has just really touched my heart. And um, I just want to encourage you. Come right on up, Mallory. I just want to encourage you. Uh, as you're dealing with some of the folks who have gone on the missions trip, uh, just encourage them because I know that each one of us is struggling. We've got our own little support group going on Facebook where, where it usually starts with Brian, quite honestly. I miss you guys. Yeah, we miss you too. So I just want to encourage you to uh, encourage it. Mallory's going to share with us. Okay. Can you hear me? I just ran up, so I'm a little bit out of breath. Um, first of all, I want to thank you guys for praying for me and thinking about me when you heard I was sick. I'm fine now. Um, it kind of had to do with all the medications I was taking for being on the trip and then coming home. And it caused a lot of like heart palpitations and racing heart. So that's what was going on. I'm fine now. I'm also really nervous. Okay, the thing that I wanted to share about Haiti. Um, when I think about the time that we spent there, I really just think about the faith that the, the Haitian Christians in that area had. Um, they were, you can see my hands are shaking. Um, they rely on God to meet their basic needs. Um, they, they truly rely on him to, to provide them with food, water, clothing, shelter. And because of that reliance on God, I think they have such a unique and strong faith um, in relationship with God. And us as Americans, we, we don't rely on God the same way. You know, we, we're really self-sufficient. We can provide ourselves with food and water and clothing and housing, and we thank God for those things. But. Um, we don't need him the way that they need him. And so I think that kind of clouds our, in a way it clouds our faith. And um, the Haitian people down there, their faith is so clear. You can see it. You can see their love for God. You can feel their passion. And I've never really seen anything like that. Um, it was really humbling to find out about halfway through the week, we found out just to show, just to say, the, the Christians down there, they're spiritual giants, really. Um, halfway through the week, we found out that the ladies making our food and cleaning up after us, the people hauling water, that they were actually missionaries that had come back from a trip where, and they have seen blind people healed, dead people raised, 
from the dead and they were snatching souls from the devil for God. And I just couldn't believe that we were being served by those people. They're so real. And it was just really amazing. They're, they have a faith that I've never seen before. And I'll try and get that, to follow that my whole life. Amen. Amen. Pastor Leslie actually shared some of those experiences with us. You know, we've seen, and he wasn't apologetic about it, but he was kind of like, we really have seen people raised from the dead, you know, because we've prayed for them. And so I just want to, again, encourage you. We, we, were, we were really touched. And, um, and that leads me to two more announcements that are not in your bulletin. Number, well, one is Pastor Leslie is actually going to be here in the month of April. He's going to come for a week. He'll be speaking on a Sunday that is in the bulletin. So I want to encourage you to be here for that. Um, first of all, he is a lively little guy, I'm telling you. He just is ready to go. And the other announcement that is not in your bulletin, but um, we are actually planning round two. Um, we will be, yeah, see a few of you go, what? <laughs> we're, we're planning a second trip to Haiti. I believe God has put three specific things on my heart um, that we will be doing there. And so um, I don't know if all three of those things are going to happen at once. They might. They may take a period of time, but we're going to keep this nation in front of us. And um, my heart is that as we would go there, that more people would grab a hold of and you would see. Um, you'd see something that will change you forever. Somebody told me this week, you know, it, it, in a few months it'll, it'll go away and you'll be back. And I, I just thought, I hope not. I hope not. I hope I never come back from what I saw. I hope I don't ever go back to being the same person. The stuff that we saw is, is amazing. So, amen, there you go. That's the announcements for today. Be praying. Maybe you're supposed to go on a trip to Haiti. Maybe you're supposed to be um, somebody helping me to raise funds. Maybe you're supposed to be somebody who's going to take that over and I'll help you um, raise funds. But uh, just know that God is, I believe God is calling us there as a church, as a body, to make a difference in that, in that do I dare say this? in that nation. Amen. It's not just about a little people group. I believe God's calling us there to do something. Really. So, um, last week we started a series called Crosswords. And we were talking about words that Jesus spoke from the cross. The first word we talked about was forsaken. Jesus, at the time that, that the Father turned away from him, turned his face. He took all the beatings, he took all the abuse, he took all the punishment from man. And, he, and we have no record of him saying anything about that. We have no record of him crying, we have no record of him saying anything to anybody uh, while he was being beaten, while he was being scourged. As a matter of fact, on trial, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to say anything in your own defense? And he didn't. And yet... There comes a point while Jesus is hanging on the cross when he is forsaken by the Father. And, you, and we talked about that last week. It's not just that he felt like he was forsaken. It's not just that he had this emotional thing that happened. God, the scriptures say God turned his eyes away from him. He, he couldn't look on him anymore because there was a point when Jesus, according to scripture, became sin for us. He was forsaken so that you and I would never have to be forsaken. The sin in our life, it's not that God looks past that, but he looks through Jesus to see us as clean. He never has to turn his eyes from us. We will never be forsaken according to what the Gospels record. So I told you that last week when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he had been humiliated, he had been punched in the face over and over, he had been beaten with rods, he had been beaten with a, a nasty evil whip that had pieces of metal and pieces of glass in it that literally ripped his body apart, beaten to the point that he was unrecognizable. And you think about it from this perspective. 
He was the creator beaten by his own creation. He was a creator. Genesis says he was there in the beginning. John says he was there in the beginning. And now Jesus has, with the help of Simon, has uh, Simon of Cyrene's drug his cross to the skull, Golgotha. And they have laid him down on this cross beam and nailed his hands. They hoisted him up in place. And actually, the first words that we hear from Jesus are in Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 24. Jesus says, Forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. The first words out of Jesus' mouth when he's hanging on the cross is forgive them. I sat this morning and I just looked over that word forgive. God, what does that mean? What does that really mean to forgive? To completely cancel. It signifies a remission of punishment that there is no longer any punishment. It, it, he's saying drop it, drop it, drop it. The offense, drop it. Literally, if you just took this this book and you said well what does it mean to forgive this is the offense you drop it you let it go it would be very easy for me to have passed over these words this morning because we've talked about forgiveness but I just felt convicted I felt strongly we cannot pass over these words we can't pass over these father forgive them they don't know what they're doing I don't know about you but if it's me that's hanging on the cross I'm betting that forgive is not the first word that comes out of my mouth. How about punish? How about judge? How about bring justice, God? Bring justice. I was their creator. I'm I'm the one who spoke life. I'm breathed. I was with you, God. You know I was there. But Jesus says, Father, forgive me. You've got to understand those few words. Forgiveness applies to everybody. It applies to everybody in this room because at some point, at some point you're going to have the opportunity to be offended. At some point you're going to hear your kid say something about you that gets you. Your kid might be in the fit of rage and call you a name. You ever had, no, no, let's not ask that. You know how I know is because I was a kid one time and I can remember saying things about my parents that were hurtful. At some point, you're going to deal with a, with a boss or with a coworker that is going to accuse you of something. At some point, you're going to be hurt. You maybe have already been hurt. Maybe somebody got up and said something or did something. I just recently had an experience where I offended somebody from the pulpit and I didn't know anything about it. And it took a couple of weeks of festering for the person to finally come and say, hey, this is what happened, man, you offended me. Maybe today you're holding on to a grudge. Maybe it's a spouse that you had an argument with and you just haven't put it to rest. Maybe it's a parent. I I can tell you experience after experience after experience where people have had unforgiveness and that unforgiveness has haunted them. A friend of mine had had an uncle who, who physically abused him. And when he finally came to Christ, he knew, actually... Actually, he was sitting in a church service and I was preaching a sermon on forgiveness and I went to shake his hand afterwards. And he looked at me, he said, how did you know? How did you know? I said, I didn't know anything. But God knows everything. His uncle had passed away and this friend of mine actually went down to the cities where his uncle was buried. He called his mom and he said, I need to know where uncle so-and-so's grave is. And she knew how badly he had hated this man. She knew how badly. And she's like, I, I'm not going to tell you. And he said, Mom, I need to go to the grave. I've accepted Christ. And he said he stood over that grave. Tears just running down his face and he could do nothing. He said, for years I wanted to go and spit on his grave. For years I wanted to do worse than that. But he said, I could do nothing 
because of the love of God, accept Christ and forgive him. Husbands and wives. A friend of mine was in full-time ministry. And he moved into a, he and his wife moved into a new city. Shortly after he moved there, he had an affair. And his wife got to the point where she said, God, I don't love him. I don't even like him. If there's any hope for him, if there's any hope for me, you got to love him through me because I can't do it. Every one of us, every one of us need to understand the truth about forgiveness. Maybe it was something that's happened weeks ago or months ago. Maybe it's something that's going on right now at work. Maybe you're in a situation that you just cannot get out of and it seems like every time you're in the middle of it, it just rubs you, it's just like open wound. Maybe it's something that happened in a church. Maybe it's something that happened in this church. Maybe there's an unforgiveness. Maybe there's something that just, every time you think of it, makes you sick. Folks, we try to handle unforgiveness. We try to, to put it out. Well, we're just not going to think about it. You can't handle unforgiveness. That's not within our ability. We can't just shuffle it underneath the, the couch. I deal with married couples all the time, and they come in and we're having a conversation, and it's like, okay, there's an elephant in the room that we're not talking about. You stuck so much stuff underneath the carpet that now you've got to walk up the hill to get to the other side. It's time to deal with the junk. And you and I, we just can't deal with it on our own. We don't have the capacity to just move on. It takes understanding the cross. I think this message is critical to each one of us. There are two things that we need to understand about forgiveness. First of all is that we, first and foremost, need to receive God's forgiveness. Jesus hung on the cross and he became sin for us so that we might be forgiven. We need to grab a hold of that. If you don't understand that, you can't even dispense forgiveness. Because that's the second thing we need to understand. Is that not only have we been forgiven, but we need to be dispensers of forgiveness. You have to grab a hold of the fact, first and foremost, that when we come to Christ and when we confess our sins, when we repent, the Bible says He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to drop the charge against us, to remit that penalty. He is faithful and just to forgive us. Most of us have been in church long enough. We've been in our churches most of our lives. We understand that. And I would dare say that most of you know that we need to forgive as well. But what Jesus said on the cross, when he spoke those words of forgiveness, it's like a crossroads in humanity. It really is a crossroads in humanity. When Jesus spoke those words, it wasn't just his words. He was repeating a prophecy that was prophesied by Isaiah 700 years earlier. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12, the second half says, He bore the sins of many, that's Jesus, and made intercession for the transgressors. He bore the sins of many and he made intercession for the transgressors. What's intercession? Intercession's prayer. In these words, Jesus was praying to the Father on behalf of those who had transgressed. You've you got you to gotta grab a hold of this. You've got to not read over this so quickly that you don't understand it. The prophecy was that he would bear, he would bore the sins of many. So here he is, hanging on the cross, carrying the sins of the world, carrying the sins of the transgressors. The transgressors were not just the people at the foot of the cross. They might have been the people that put him on the cross, but he was there for your sin. He was there for my sin. We're the transgressors. And here he begins to pray, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. They, 
they don't know what they're doing. And so Jesus prays for the people at the foot of the cross. We think that it's just some kind of flippant, it's flippant statement. It's not. It's not. It is the first, it's a point in history. It's a point in history that we've never been at. Humanity has never been at before. They've never been there. Maybe you say, you know what, I've been praying for somebody a long time, a long time. Like, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. You and I, we're, we've come to Christ, you, people have come to Christ because Jesus intercedes for us. But these words are more than just a prayer, and they're more than just a prophecy. You see, they changed everything. Forgiveness is the point of the cross. Before Jesus hung on the cross. Before, before he accepted the forgiveness, before he dispensed the forgiveness of God, before he prayed for the forgiveness, the, the mantra was, you've hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. In the New Testament, Paul says, you heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, right? Right? That's what Paul says, Right? That was the rule. That was the way things went. That's what life was about previous to Jesus. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You know, in London, back probably around the early 40s, I believe it was, there was actually a law on the books that said, this was just as cars were coming into place, if somebody hit your car, you had the legal right to drive around the block and do the same damage to their car. How's that for stupidity at its finest? Because somebody rear-ended your car, now you're going to drive around and hit them with what? The front end of your car? And yet, and yet, you and I struggle with that same thing today. I just want you to know what I'm feeling. I just, I just want to understand how bad they hurt me. You'll never know how bad you hurt me. I'm not going to forgive. We do it even in far more subtle ways, folks. We do it in far more subtle ways. Sometimes it's not, we grit our teeth, and we, sometimes we just walk around with a smile on our face and an attitude in our heart. And we go, yeah, sure. Have a good day. And we carry that grudge. And we carry that hurt. And you and I, we have the opportunity. We can do it with our in-laws. We can do it with our friends. We can do it with our children. We can do it with our bosses. But I want to tell you, unforgiveness is poison to your soul. It is poison to your soul. We think that unforgiveness is going to hurt somebody else. I walked downstairs and found a little bit of dual force drainal form drain cleaner. Okay, let's just say that on this missions trip, Kim said something to me that was a little outrageous and it kind of ticked me off. And there was opportunity. Let's just say that I chose not to forgive Kim. Choosing not to forgive Kim is basically the equivalent of taking this cleaner. I'm really not going to open it up. Why waste it? It's just not open. Dumping it into this glass. Taking a big old drink and saying, I'll fix her. I'll fix her. I'm not going to talk to her again. I'll fix her. It's just like drinking a glass of poison and me expecting her to get sick. Again, let's talk about stupidity as its finest. Is that really going to happen? First of all, we got along great. She didn't say anything to me that was offensive. We, we got through it all. There's, we're, we're, we're on good terms. So just know that. Anybody, I don't care who it is. I don't care who it is. You, next time, next time you're tempted to hold a grudge against somebody, the next time you're even tempted to think that, like, just imagine yourself pouring a glass of drain cleaner and drinking it because that is the poison that you're drinking into your soul. That's what you're drinking into your life. Forgiveness has nothing to do with the other person. Forgiveness has everything to do with you. Previous to Christ, the only response, the pre-Christ response was, I'm going to get you back an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But Jesus taught his, look what Jesus taught his disciples. 
to pray. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, partway into to the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, pray these words. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. It's this point of the cross, it's the pinnacle that says, God, we're going to forgive our, our, those people who have, who, who have wounded us, who have hurt us, because, because, not because of anything that we've done, not because of where they're but because you have forgiven us. As we come towards Easter again, I'd love, I'd like to say, you know what, it, it, it's, we've talked about forgiveness, but Jesus on the cross takes forgiveness to a whole new level. He takes it to a whole new level. He said, we're going to fall into one of two categories. We're either going to need to receive forgiveness or we're going to need to be dispensers of forgiveness. Forgiveness is an important message. Let me ask you a question. Where would we be without forgiveness? Where would we be without forgiveness? The answer is hell. The ultimate answer is hell. Especially as believers in Christ. Especially as believers in Christ especially as followers, we have no right to hang on to unforgiveness. We have no right. If you're struggling today, if you think I'm dealing with some unforgiveness, I'm dealing with some hurts, I'm dealing with some things that I just can't, I can't, Pastor, I cannot get past them. I'm going to tell you we offer a class called Freedom in Christ for you. This is not a commercial for freedom in Christ. But it's the reality. Sometimes we struggle with the past in such a way that it changes who we are. It rocks us to the very core of our being. Maybe you've experienced something. Maybe you've experienced a hurt. Maybe maybe you actually are struggling with forgiveness towards God. You know that there are people that struggle with forgiveness towards God. God, I can't believe you'd let me go through this. And they put up a wall. I have a younger brother who lost two children. In a very short period of time. Had a little boy that was born about a month old. He died of SIDS. A couple of years later, his wife was pregnant again. And she found out that one of the babies had trisomy 13, which is just a devastating disease. And the twins were born and a little girl lived just a matter of hours. And my brother has struggled. He's struggled to accept God again. He just basically just walked away from God. I've tried that church thing. It doesn't work. I've tried that God thing. Folks, maybe your struggle with a hurt comes from what you perceive as something that God did. The truth of the matter is we have an enemy. He seeks to kill and to destroy. Maybe you struggle with forgiving yourself. Matthew chapter 18 talks about a servant that was forgiven. I want to read I want to read this today as we was thinking about it. In this chapter, just previous to this, this account of the servant, Peter is talking to Jesus and he's talking about forgiveness. And I don't know why he's talking about forgiveness. Maybe he had a tough day. Maybe he had a struggle that he was going with. Maybe he forgave somebody. But he comes to Jesus and he says, so how many times are we supposed to forgive anyhow? Like seven times? I mean, that would be good. You know, if somebody offends us like seven times, maybe that would be a good number. And Jesus says, not seven times, but 70 times seven. And I think Peter was probably still struggling with the math. And Jesus just begins to plow ahead in Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 23. Right after Jesus says 70 times seven, he says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king 
who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought before him. Now, King James, I believe, says, says 10,000 talents or a number of talents. Each talent, according to the Greek dictionary that I looked at, each talent was equal to one year's wages. No, no, no. It was equal to 20 years of a working man's wages. Each talent was equal to 20 years worth of a working man's wages. Different translations say different things. Some say 10,000 talents. One translation says a million dollars. What it amounts to, it was an amount that was unpayable. It was a debt he could not pay. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that they had be sold to repay the debt. And the truth of the matter is, in those days, that was legal. That was legal. It was legal for the man who was owed the money to throw his debtor in prison. It was legal. I almost wonder if some of those days wouldn't be better. It might kind of curb some of the problems that we have with credit cards in our country, right? But I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. That old law, that old nature still resides. We're free from it, but you and I both know that if we owe somebody money, it kind of forces us to walk on the other side of the street sometimes. That old nature is still alive. That old law is still there. We don't really like to be in debt to anyone. Anyhow, he has this man thrown in debt, or he's going to have this man thrown in jail. And verse 26 says, At this the servant fell to his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I'll pay everything back. And the servant's master took pity on him and he canceled the debt. There's a couple of things that we need to understand that we hear in this passage of Scripture, that we read in this passage of Scripture. One of the things that we read is, first of all, not every debtor will be able to pay back their debt. You and I can never pay back the debt. We can never pay back the debt that Jesus purchased for us because there's no way for us to atone for our own sins. We can't do it. But there are other things that happen in life that people cannot pay for. They cannot change. Somebody goes out and spreads some kind of nasty rumor about you. Let's just say you share something with a friend in confidence. You tell them something that's taken place in your life in confidence. And the next thing you know, somebody's reading about it on Facebook. Guess what? You can't take that back. You cannot take that back. Oh, you can take it off of Facebook, but it's out there. I read the account, not the account, I read a story. It's a Jewish proverb of a man who started to spread some rumors about the rabbi. And after a fashion, he realized that they were wrong, and he went to the rabbi, and he said, Rabbi, Rabbi, I've been telling all kinds of people all kinds of rumors about you, and I wonder if you would forgive me. And the the rabbi said, Absolutely, I'll forgive you, but I just need you to do this one thing first. So what I want you to do is I want you to take a pillow to the highest hill in town. And the guy's thinking, well, okay. And he said, when you get to the top of the hill, he said, I want you to rip it open and I want you to shake those feathers all over the town. And he's like, oh, all right. So so he comes back a few days later and he says, pastor, pastor, rabbi, rabbi, I want to let you know I went to the top of the hill and I shook the pillow and the feathers went all over town. Will you forgive me now? And he said, sure, as soon as you go and pick up all those feathers. Impossible, right? There are people who have offended you and there is no way for them to make it right. You got to grab a hold of that. You got to grab a hold of that. There is no way for them to make it right. And we see that in this verse where the, the guy who is in debt cries out and he says, be patient, please, please be patient with me. He doesn't even ask for forgiveness. He's going to do everything that he can to make it right. And he's forgiven. He's forgiven millions, maybe tens of millions of dollars. He's forgiven this astronomical debt. And as we read the story, we read the account, you probably know the story. But in In uh, verse 27, the servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. One thing that we learn here, 
Some people will never, ever be able to pay back the debt. But the second thing that we learn here is that you and I have the ability, regardless of the debt, you and I have the ability to dispense mercy. We can dispense mercy. So this dude comes out and he's got no more debt. Debt. He's debt free. He doesn't have a mortgage on his house. Doesn't have a mortgage on his car. Doesn't have a mortgage on his camels. Doesn't have a mortgage on anything. He walks out. He's debt free. Starting in verse 32. Well, no. Then, then what he does in the meantime is he 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 sees somebody who owes him a hundred bucks or a thousand bucks, and he grabs him by the throat and he says, "You owe me money, and if you don't pay me now, I'm going to throw you throw him in jail." And the master finds out about this starting in verse 32 and I know you're sitting there you're saying ah pastor we've heard this a hundred times yep and it's just as real this time as it is the first Matthew chapter 18 verse 32 then the master called the servant and he said you wicked servant I canceled all the debt because you begged me to shouldn't you have had the mercy on your fellow servant just as I had in his anger the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. And then in verse 35, this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. And you think, God, how could you be so harsh? How could you be so, how could you say such a thing? Unforgiveness is like poison. That's how he could say such a thing. It doesn't have anything to do with the other person. It's that you're eating and you're drinking poison into your soul. I'm going to tell you, if you're involved in any kind of leadership, if you're involved in any kind of ministry, if you're involved in any kind of service, if you're involved in eating, sleeping, drinking, or breathing, and you grab a hold of unforgiveness, and you let it reside in there, it is going to keep you from fulfilling what God has called you to do in your life, hands down, bar none, end of sentence. It's going to stop it. It's going to preclude anything. That unforgiveness will, will... I want to show you a couple pictures. Will you please show me a slide of Haiti? This is the orphanage. When Alan and Lonnie went to, went to Haiti, there was no orphanage there. This, on this side here is the orphanage. And what I want you to look at is I want you to look at this wall. Okay, you see where the wall comes up and then it stops right about at the top of the gate. In 2014, when the earthquake happened, that's all the higher the wall was, and the walls came down around the orphanage. At that time, I believe there were 12 or 14 little boys living in that orphanage. Next slide, please. So here you can see that the wall, well, there's Mallory, look at that. And there's our, our driver. So the wall was not only rebuilt, but then they added, well, you know what? When the wall was rebuilt initially, they didn't add that piece on top. They built it to that first height. Please show me the next slide. Inside of this doorway, you see that little red building? That red building is a guard shack. When the walls were built up to the top of the gate, shortly after the earthquake that was rebuilt, Pastor Leslie was staying there with his family and with these little boys. Somebody climbed over the wall. And when the guard who was in the guard shack looked out, he was killed. He was shot. Pastor Leslie was beaten literally within an inch of his life. His wife and his daughter were physically abused and beaten. We were there. They came back then, back up one slide if you could. They came back and they rebuilt those walls higher and they put razor wire over it. About two blocks from this is where Pastor Leslie lives and the walls are still down in his house. You know what? He won't live in his house. He won't stay in his house. He stays here when he's in town. Now I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you a story about this man. I'm not trying to put Pastor Leslie on any kind of pedestal. Three months, four months, after this event happened, one of the guys who beat him up came to his church and asked if he could have $50 because he needed food for his family. 
are you going to do? What am I going to do? Maybe you say, well, maybe it wasn't the man. It doesn't make any difference if it was the man or not. When Pastor Leslie saw him, that's who he saw. That's who he thought it was. That's who he, to this day, believes that's who it was, was the man who beat him. What are we, what are we going to do with that? He paused long enough to make you really wonder what he did. And he said, I, I had the money, so... I gave it to him. He said, what choice do I have? What choice do I have considering the forgiveness that I've received? What choice do I have but to forgive? That's kind of hard to swallow. But that's where forgiveness really lives. That's where forgiveness really lives. It lives in the details. It lives in somebody really, truly, honest to goodness, offending us, hurting us to the absolute core of our being, and then coming back and expecting us to act like nothing happened. And you have a choice. And I have a choice every day. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 14. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you your sins. When we went through this class that Cindy Lou teaches on Tuesday nights, The Bondage Breaker. There's also another one called Victory Over the Darkness. One of the things that they talk about is not being stupid. If you go to a place and you get beat up every time you walk in the door, stop going there. Okay? You don't go back. You don't put yourself in that dangerous spot. But you forgive. You don't hang on to the burden of it. If somebody in your life is... is, is just because you forgive doesn't mean that you go back and you automatically trust. Just because you forgive doesn't... We've got to get a right picture of that. But don't hang on to the garbage. Don't hang on to it. Do all that you can to restore that relationship. Do all that you can to do it. But don't hang on to the garbage. Hanging on to the garbage is like drinking poison. And it will affect you. If it doesn't affect you today, it will affect you tomorrow. If you don't feel it tomorrow, you're going to feel it in six weeks. You're going to feel it in two years. You're going to feel it in five years. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. My challenge to you today. My challenge to you today is stop trying to manage it. Stop trying to forgive it. Stop trying to figure it out. I'm sorry, I didn't mean forgive. I mean stop trying to forget it. Stop trying to forget it. Stop trying to manage it. Stop trying to figure it out. And make that same step towards forgiveness that Jesus made. If you don't feel anything like forgiving, stand there honestly and openly before your God and simply repeat the words that Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. They don't know how badly they've hurt me. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Take that step. That doesn't mean at the end of the day you're going to feel like you're going to have, want to have a party. It doesn't mean at the end of the day that, that, that you're never going to deal with the emotion of that hurt again. It doesn't mean that Pastor Leslie stood there and, and that was years ago when that beating took place. And it, was, and it was years ago when he gave the person that money and he still felt the pain of it, but he was free from the guilt inside. He was free from that thing that brought guilt and condemnation inside. He was free from that. He was free from the poison of that. Take that step today. Jesus bore our sins and he prayed for his transgressors. He prayed for you and I that we would be able to walk in forgiveness, that we would be able to receive his forgiveness and then be dispensers of it. Do not forget, folks, that's what what Easter is about. That's what this season is about. That was the focus of the cross. That's the life and the hope that we have. That's the only hope we have. 
Amen? I'm going to pray as we close. If you're here today and you say, you know what, I just got, I got junk. I need someone to pray for me. I want to let you know that the altar is going to be open. You can come up here and pray by yourself if you want to. You can ask an elder to pray with you. We'll be here to pray with you. Father, I thank you for each person who's here. I thank you for each person who has heard my voice. I thank you for each person who has heard your word today. God, whether they're in this building, whether they listen on TV, whether they're watching on a computer, God, I pray that you would convict us, you would touch us, you would move us. Father, that you would set us free from that that pain, that sorrow, that is unforgiveness, that you would set us free from that poison of unforgiveness, the hanging on to, and and God hanging on to something that's going to kill us. God, I pray that you'd set us free from that. Lord, I ask you to touch each heart. I don't care, God, whether it's something big or something that's little. Lord, if there's something that we've just buried and we've buried and we've buried and we've buried and we said we're not going to respond, we're not going to respond, we're not going to respond, we're going to manage it, God, I pray that if there's unforgiveness in our hearts, any one of us, that you would, by the power of your Holy Spirit, reveal that unforgiveness. Reveal it, God. If it means speaking to us in the dead of night when we're sleeping, you give us a dream, you speak to us, reveal that that unforgiveness so that we can really truly honestly be set free that we can be set free to worship that we can be set free to love that we can be set free to to open ourselves up to one another God don't let us off the hook Holy Spirit convict us where there's unforgiveness convict us God, I pray that as we confess that, that you would work in our hearts and our lives. You would work in our hearts and our lives, God. That you'd set us free from the burden and from the bondage. We may not even be set free from the consequences because some of the stuff is just, it's out there. But regardless of the consequences, we're set free in our heart. Help us, God, to be dispensers of forgiveness in our daily walk. In Jesus' name I pray all these things. Amen. 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 Again, you're free to go if you'd like, but if you want to come forward and would like prayer, uh, that's available for you. Thanks for joining us for today's broadcast. You are also invited to join us in person, Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m. Viewers like you help to make this program possible. If you'd like to help, send your tax-deductible contributions to the address on your screen or give online at cfcdl.org. Thank you. enjoy this program we'd love to hear from you comments can be sent to us online or write to us at the address on your screen thanks again for joining us see you next week